All right, folks, so this, uh, this class is Physiological Psychology. Your book's Physiology and Behavior. This great guy, Neil Carlson. Uh, Carlson's been writing this book for like 40 years, right? Um, which is a long time. A couple of editions ago, he picked up a co-author, I think largely because he's getting really old, I mean, is my assumption, right? He's been writing this book for a while. It's a great text. I recommend you read it. There are some funny stories, actually, in it. Uh, which, which I think are going to be surprising to you, right? Like most of you read a textbook and you're like, well, I wasn't ready for that. Uh, but it's going to be in there. So it's a good book. I recommend you spend some time with it. It's complicated material, but uh, you're going to listen to me for a while. You're going to read it. You're going to do all the other fun things. It's going to be exciting. All right. So I, I, a lot of you uh, who raised your hand who weren't psych majors, you're okay with this, right? This is going to be a biology-heavy course. It's in there, right? Physiology. When you see physiology, you automatically think, like, you know, stuff in your body's doing things, right? It's what physiology means. The study of stuff in your body doing things. So, it's a cumbersome Greek word, but it's in there. Don't worry if, you're, if you don't think you're strong in biology, right? Because I get a lot of psych folks who are like, oh, I went into psychology because I didn't want to do biology. Well, that was stupid. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why later. This class is going to be different than your other classes, right? We're actually going to use biology, some chemistry, physics uh, to really explain behavior, right? We're still thinking about behavior, which is going to be different than maybe some of your, you know, strict biology courses or, or you know, if you took human anatomy and physiology, you weren't really focused on behaviors, right? You were just thinking about here's how the kidney, you know, shoots urine out, right? And that's fine. Uh, you know, you learned about nephrons and all that business, right? And we're going to think about that, but we're going to think about it in a different way. If we start thinking about the kidneys, we're going to think about um, lipid solubility of drugs, right? Whether you're excreting that drug or that drug's staying in your system and has an effect on your, your nervous system, right? So we're going to think about how that affects your behavior, okay? So we're going to approach it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, either way you go, right? Whether you've been studying behavior or you've been studying just physiology, we're going to bring the two together here, and we're going to think about physiology and behavior together, how these two interact, okay? So hopefully, when this is all done, we're going to kind of think of a new way of thinking about behaviors. It's going to be exciting. Questions, comments, concerns? This is like my third class this week. My throat's going to kill me. All right. I know everybody loves carousels, right? I think about this class like a carousel. We're just going to keep going around in circles and circles and circles, right? And I will constantly say to you, do you remember that time I said? And then I'm going to say something really profound. And you're going to go, oh, yes, I do. Well, now it's related to this new thing we're talking about, all right? So we're constantly going to be making connections and callbacks, okay? So if you fall off the carousel, stop over and get us some popcorn. Come right back. We'll pick you up, and then we'll see where we go. There are going to be times where you're going to be confused, right? You just need to sit with your discomfort for a little bit. Don't sit there too long, right? You'll find where that balance is. Because if you sit there too long, you need to go, hey, I'm completely lost, right? Somehow I ended up on, you know, the tilt of world uh, and I should have come back to the carousel. But if you're a little bit confused, just wait a minute. See if it comes back around. We're going to revisit it. We're going to talk about it again. We're going to talk about other evidence, right, that's going to come back and touch on, on whatever the topic is. So kind of hang there with it. It's going to be fun, okay? I do like to think about sort of a hierarchy of understanding and think about layers, right? So we're going to be building layers. Some of you are going to get some of the deeper layers. Some of you are only going to get the surface layers. It's going to be okay, right? You'll find where you are, and that's going to shift throughout the semester, right? We're going to talk about something you find exciting, and you're going to get really in-depth on that. We're going to talk about something not so exciting, and you're going to kind of skim along the surface, okay? We want to make sure you get a nice grasp of the material, but make sure you're hanging in there in the right place. The last sort of little orientation point I want to give you is that I am a reductionist, right? And that means that I want to take things down to that smallest level possible, right? I'm not going to get too carried away and get down to like, you know, quantum mechanics and things and use that to describe behavior. That's a little far. But we are going to get down to at least the biological level, right? And we're going to hang out there. It's going to be fun there. How many of you have taken like social psychology? How many of you are taking it now? Great. That's too bad. You could have dropped it because uh, it was a waste of your time. I don't know. Probably not. I, I mean, you have to take it. It's still required for the degree, but whatever. Uh, 
social psychology is different, right? Because we're thinking about like a whole group of people and how like a whole group of you do things differently than like one of you, right? And how does that group work or whatever? Well, that seems very uh, non-reductionist, right? A group of people is clearly not the smallest unit possible. Okay. The smallest unit possible, uh, for our purposes, we're going to think about like neurotransmitters, right? We're going to think about ion channels, and we're going to get down to that level. It's going to be exciting. We'll spend some time there. We'll bounce up to like neurons and circuits. Uh, maybe think about your whole nervous system. Okay, that's that's where we're going to live for this course. Right? That would be very difficult if you were trying to explain the nervous system of each of the individuals right in that group, right? Simultaneously, and you start to think, well, that could be a complicated process. But we're going to think about one of those, and uh, we're going to have fun with it. All right, these are the topics we're going to try to cover today. We'll talk a little bit about the foundations of behavioral neuroscience. We'll talk about natural selection and evolution, how that's important to you for this course. We will talk about some ethical issues with research because we're going to talk a lot about research studies, right? So it's important for you to know, are these folks doing the right things? Probably not going to talk too much about careers and so forth going forward, but uh, we'll spend a little time on that. Here are learning objectives. You're welcome to read those uh, if you want. What we want to do first is kind of give you a foundational understanding of behavioral neuroscience, right? So we want to kind of step back. We're going to take a little bit of a, of a, of a march through history. The reason we do this is to bring you all up to speed to where we are now, right? kind of need to give you this background information, how we got to where we are today. There's some really fun stories there that I, I think you'll find entertaining as well as informative. So we're going to do that. Uh, it's important for us because in the past, I mean, if we think about some of the, the ideas we had in the past, like one of the big ones was your brain doesn't change once you're an adult, right? And that would be really bad. Uh, because most of you are adults, and I really hope your brain can change, right? And I'm really working hard on that. So that's an important thing to me. Today, we know that there is still neurogenesis, creation of new neurons in the human brain, now in the adult brain. Now, it's not happening everywhere like it was when you were a little kid, but it's still happening, right? And we know that it's happening. We can measure this. We can influence this uh, up or down. So that's important. Most of the changes that we've learned about, you know, when we've had these sort of major revelations in our understanding of the nervous system, this has come along because we have a better methodological approach, right? So every time microscopes became more powerful, we learned something new about the nervous system, right? And there's actually a really interesting story. We'll talk about that um, with Cajal. I don't know if you guys know Cajal. Won a Nobel Prize in the early 1900s. Um, there was this giant debate between early neuroscientists. Some people thought all of your neurons were all connected like they were all touching each other, it was just this big giant net of things, right? And then there was these other guys who said, no, they're individual neurons, right? They're individual discrete cells, you can look at them, you can measure them, you can see what they're doing. Once our methods improved to where we could image individual neurons, right? And we could see that they were discrete units, we kind of figured out, hey, it's neurons. Uh, they gave Cajal a Nobel Prize for that. That was kind of interesting. He was an interesting guy. I'll tell you all about him here in just a moment once we move there. So we want to take that foundational approach so we're all on the same page. When we're thinking about research, we want to think about what are the goals, what are we trying to figure out. For us, we want to think about behavior, but we're going to study the physiological process related to that, right, that's driving that behavior, how that physiological process uh, works, but also how it makes you do things differently. We're going to think about generalizations. We're going to try to deduce laws, right? We're going to take these specific events, use those events to predict things that might happen in the future, right? That's really what we want to do. So if we can understand how one of these guys works, right, one brain cell works, then we can figure out uh, how multiple brain cells work, maybe we can start to predict what happens um, under different conditions. So that's kind of interesting. We're always going to be working toward those more basic elements, uh, especially in this class we want to think about things again at that lowest level, right? Okay. 
We want to think about why. Why is it happening? But why is it happening? And look at the biological underpinnings, right? One of the important things for us to think about uh, is that behaviors can happen for different reasons. How many of you have ever coughed? Yeah, there are like how many different reasons that you could cough, right? A bunch, okay? Nest building is similar, right? How many of you have ever built a nest? Yeah, it's a lot of fun, right? You should do that. Go home, tear up a little bit of paper, put it over in the corner, curl up inside of it. Uh, mice, so if you're a mouse, there are two reasons you'll build a nest. One is you're cold, and the other is you're pregnant. So the best way to figure out if a mouse is pregnant is to put a flame underneath of its cage, and if it still builds a nest, then you know it's not pregnant. Or, I mean, you know it's not cold, because you have, like, the fire there, right? So it's warm. So if you roast a mouse and it still builds a nest, Cynthia, you're pretty clear it's pregnant. Uh, so it could be because you have other little mice inside of it, so we'll put little mice inside of that mouse, right? It could be because it's pregnant. Could be because it's cold, right? So we're going to draw some ice cubes here. It's just cold coming off the ice cubes. So that's interesting. So we always want to generalize and reduce, right? That's what we're really trying to do here. We're trying to make generalizations about the rules of how your nervous system works. And we're going to try to reduce that down to its smallest unit so we can figure out what's going on. All right. So if you are a behavioral neuroscient neuroscientist or you're interested in that, uh, you've got to be an expert in two things, which I know sounds like a lot of work. Uh, but when you're done, you can be like twice as pretentious, which is always great because then you, you're an expert in two things, right? Uh, in behavior and in physiology. So you're an expert in both of those. So, so there you go. Who wants to be an expert in just one thing? That's not great. Expert in two things. All right. How many of you love duelists? That's with an A, not an E. You've got to watch those guys. Um, the duelist with an E will shoot you, right? That's when you like walk in opposite directions and turn. Uh, the duelist with an A, that's a whole different story. Uh, dualism is the idea that there is a physical body, uh, but then you've got some mind or soul or whatever that's not physical, right? There's like some separate non-physical entity. The, uh, you know, kind of other point of view here is monism, right? This is that the world is only con uh, consisting of matter and energy, right? And whatever sort of mind that you have, it's just a production of the workings of your nervous system. I largely don't care what you are when you leave here. I do want maybe on some level. But in here, we really need people to be monists, right? Uh, if you are a dualist with an A or an E, you're not going to do well in this class, okay? Uh, because, you know, it's going to be, be uh, contrary to the explanation of things that we're doing. So we want to think about things from that uh, monistic. Yeah, monistic, right? You don't want to put another syllable in there because then it's like monks. So you want to make sure you're a monist. Questions about that? It's nothing too complicated. Uh, models, yeah, yeah, models are great. Um, how many of you have ever put together one of those little models? It's like an airplane. No. Uh, for models, we're thinking about ways that we can explain or have an analogy for a physiological process. We'll do that in this class. We'll talk about different kinds of models to describe uh, behavior and how different systems work. All right. I'll start with a little bit of a history lesson, right? I mean, nobody thought they were getting history today, but we really need to think about the history for a couple of reasons. One, gives you the idea of like how long folks have been thinking about brains. So that's interesting. Uh, but two, again, it'll help us all catch up, right? In case some of us are a couple centuries behind on our knowledge about the brain, right? Some of you may be, that's fine. So we'll, we'll get you caught up, right? We'll bring you up into this century and then we'll start from there. It's gonna be exciting. So we've got uh, Hippocrates. You guys know Hippocrates, right? The Hippocratic Oath. Anybody know about the Hippocratic Oath? This is the thing your doctor does so that they just don't like randomly hit you in the head with a hammer, right? Which would be exciting, I guess, if you were a doctor and didn't take the Hippocratic Oath. And like, well, watch this. I think you have to put that on your business card, right? Did not take Hippocratic Oath. Watch for flying hammers. Uh, Hippocrates had this idea that like the brain was the center of thoughts and emotions. And that was 
pretty awesome, right? Lots of other folks had said, no, it's probably not the brain. There's nothing up there. Um, it's probably the heart, right? That's not necessarily a stupid answer. It's an uninformed answer, right? Uh, how many of you have ever been excited? Yeah, nervous, angry. Yeah, where'd you feel that? Your heart was beating faster, right? So that made some sense, right? Nobody, like, you got excited and all of a sudden, like, your brain was pulsing, right? Like, you could actually, like... Uh, so, you know, there you go, right? So Hippocrates wasn't... I mean, he had some, some great, great ideas there. Actually, the earliest use of the word brain is on an Egyptian papyrus, which is kind of interesting. It's a story about a guy who got kicked in the head by a horse. Uh, he had a head injury while he was farming, and then afterward he had some, uh, you know, behavioral problems, as you would imagine. So, kind of interesting. So there were other folks besides uh, the Greeks who were thinking about brains and, and so forth. So then we got to fast forward a few centuries, right, to get to this guy, Rene Descartes. Any, anybody a Rene Descartes fan? I'll tell you some fun stories about Rene Descartes. Um, he's known as the father of modern philosophy. He was a philosopher. So these early guys were largely philosophers. They weren't scientists. There's a big difference between a philosopher and a scientist, right? The big difference is um, here's what a philosopher does all day. They just think, right? That's what a philosopher does, by definition. A scientist, by definition, actually like does stuff, right? So they, they, they still have ideas, right? And they still come up with concepts and things, but a scientist will actually do something to test that idea. A philosopher will just continue to think about it. He may think about that experiment, but he'll never do it, right? He's like, there's a possible outcome. There's a big difference between a philosopher and a scientist. And at this point in history, we're not... We're not out of that philosophical um, prison. Is that a word I can use? Uh, we're, we're not out of that. You know, I don't. Nobody like talks about philosophy as a dark age kind of thing, right? But but for those of us who are interested in like actual experiments and science and you know empirical evidence, then it sort of is, right? So it's sort of those those dark ages. Uh, he was a dualist with an A. I don't, I think he was a pacifist, so I don't imagine he was a dualist with an E. Um, he was sort of a weird dualist, though. Prior to him, everybody who was a dualist was like, yeah, physical body and then like some other thing, not physical. And then he said, hey, you got a physical body, but I bet that non-physical thing is like in your brain somewhere. So that kind of made him an odd sort of dualist, right? And a kind of an important step toward monism. He thought it was the pineal body. Uh, I'm going to tell you the pineal body, it, it, it is not like where anything important is, okay, so you're not going to have to worry about that. It's really well protected, right? It's encased in a lot of bone, and so you would imagine it would be important, right? Anybody have valuables? You keep those in a safe? Anybody keep, nobody keeps valuables in a safe? Something you do? What's the combination? Oh, it's a key. Ah, uh, that's true. Uh, I just found out my bank will give me a free safety deposit box because I have some fancy checking account that I didn't know I had. Yeah, it's like the one perk of working here, right? Like my bank is like, yeah, they're like a preferred work partner or something. I guess they feel confident Marshall will continue to pay me. I don't, but I guess they do. Uh, so, <laughs> so they'll give me a free safety. I got nothing to put in there, but I'm gonna put, I'm gonna like write myself a note and just like stick it in there. Then I'm gonna go check on it every day just to see if it's still there and like make them pull out the key. That was gonna be annoying. But yep, still my note. It's the way it goes. So Descartes, pineal body, whatever. And then he had this weird idea about ventricles. Anybody know what ventricles are? They're like these fluid-filled spaces in your brain, right? And we'll talk a lot about them later. We'll talk about the cerebrospinal fluid and all the stuff that's floating around in there. Descartes had this idea that they kind of work like pneumatic sacs, right? And so if you want to, like, move your arm, you got to squeeze one of your ventricles, and then all of a sudden, like, your arm pops out and it does stuff. I know, that's weird, right? And we think it's stupid, but... Again, this was a guy who didn't really do stuff. He just thought about things. So if you're just thinking about things and you saw the inside of someone's head, you're like, well, that's kind of squishy. I bet that squeezes like a muscle and the arm comes out. He actually got this idea. Uh, he was visiting some gardens in France, and they, uh, the system was set up on, like, pneumatics, right? So if you stepped on a stone, as you were, I'm, I'm going to draw, this is what Descartes looked like while he was walking in the garden. He's got one of those ruffle collars. That's what all those guys wore back then. Probably some funny wig. Uh, and when he would step on this, it would actually activate 
this pneumatic underground system and all of a sudden like you know this giant statue would like whirl around at you and it had like a trident that was going to stab him um so it was frightening and so i i imagine this was a very impactful experience i think he probably wet himself a little bit when that happened because he based his whole idea of how your brain works on that one experience you know he's like whoa you just like step on this stone and like poseidon comes at you it's not how it works but what did he know nothing uh, and there you go. There's like a drawing of the brain that he made, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's actually not a terribly inaccurate drawing, but um, but the idea was inaccurate. The second thing, I'll tell you, anybody curious why this class meets at 4 o'clock? It's because I teach it. Um, and that's why it doesn't meet at 8 o'clock. <clears throat> Again, because I teach it, right? Uh, Descartes actually died because he got up early. And I'm doing my best to avoid that. True story about Descartes. Uh, philosophers, still today, if you're a philosopher, there are really only two places you can get employment. One of those is like a teaching institution, and the other might be a think tank, right? So you might get a job there. That's where you, I mean, that's where like those evil philosophers want to go because they don't, you know, care what happens with their ideas. They just want the money. Philosophers who actually like have some ethics, they come to universities and work because you're not getting any money, really, but, you know, your ideas are going to like help and that's what they tell themselves. It's like, help you do better in life or whatever. So, uh, he got a job uh, teaching, right? So, that's what he would do. Uh, so, you know, royalty, French royalty would hire him, and then he would, like, teach their kids things. So, uh, he got a job later in his life, not when he was old, but just toward the end of his life, because he died not long after this. He got a job where he had to get up and teach the kids at, like, 6 a.m., right? He was a notorious late riser. He would never get up early, right? I mean, if you're a philosopher, why, why get up early, you know? Stay up all night and play. I guess they didn't have Xbox then. I don't know what he was doing late at night. Um, but he, he wasn't sleeping. So he had to get up early. He did this for like six weeks and then he died. Just like unexpectedly. Uh, yeah. So there you go, right? So don't get up early. It can kill you. It's a true story. Hey, look at this great guy. This is Johann Mueller. And this should have two dots above it. I don't know why it doesn't. Uh, Mueller was a great guy. And he was a German physiologist, 19th century. He was one of the most important guys to really think about experimental approaches, right? So this is sort of the shift, right, from philosophy to science. Okay, so we're moving here, right? We're not just going to think about things, we're going to do things, right? And so that's what Mueller was. He was very forceful to advocate for experimental techniques. His whole idea was if we don't like do method methodological experiments, if we're not you know, constantly adjusting things in this, uh, this standard way, then we're not really gonna know anything, right? We can't just think about it, we gotta do it. So what he would do is he would actually um, isolate organs from an animal and then he would expose them to different chemicals and see how they responded, right? And that actually is a very scientific approach, right? You take an organ, you isolate it, so you're dealing with this sort of, you know, again, we're reducing, right? So we're reducing down to just, just a kidney or just a liver, right? And then we're going to expose it to different chemicals and see how that responds, okay? So that was his idea. This is sort of a before picture of Mueller. Here's sort of an after picture of Mueller. Uh, doesn't look as happy there for some reason. I don't know why. Looks a little disgruntled. But one of the most important things that Johann Mueller developed was what's called the doctrine of specific nerve energies. Okay. Mueller figured out all nerves carry the same signal. And that signal is an electrical impulse, right? And today we would call that an action potential. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about action potentials, right? Um, in the next chapter or so. So Every single nerve is carrying the exact same signal. The question then becomes, how do you know if you've heard something? Let me draw a nice ear. Or if you saw something, and so here's an eye. Nice eyelashes. And, uh, okay. How do you know if you saw something or if you, you heard something? It's the same signal once that gets started. And so Mueller said, well, it's got to be where it starts and it's got to be where it ends. So if it starts in your eye, it's going to go to a place called visual cortex. Still that same 
you know, electrical signal. If it starts in your ear, it's going to go to a place called auditory cortex, right? It's still that same electrical signal. Okay? It's just an electrical signal. It's just an action potential, right? It's the same action potential, whether it's coming from a stimulus that's uh, working on your rods and cones or it's working on your inner hair cells in your ear. The same electrical signal. Now, they might come more quickly, they might come more slowly, depending on the intensity and the type of the stimulus, but it's the exact same electrical signal, which is pretty impressive, right? Just a little bit later, we had a guy named Pierre Florenz. Pierre Florenz was one of the first folks to really sort of uh, systematically try to figure out what different parts of the brain uh, are responsible for in an animal. So he would take an animal, he would uh, remove part of its brain, okay, and then he would take a look and observe, that's the key word, he would observe, not think about, he would actually observe their behavior. So if he removed a small piece of brain and he realized, well, that animal can no longer blink, that nucleus is responsible for blinking, right? That makes sense. It's a really, it's really, it's an approach we use today. In fact, we have a much more detailed way of inactivating or removing brain tissue, right? He was sort of just using a knife and randomly cutting away chunks of things, right? We have much better visualization. We actually even have reversible ways we can do this now. How many of you have heard of uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation? So this is when you take like a really powerful magnet and you blast it into somebody's brain, turns off part of their brain temporarily, right? It'll come back on later, so don't worry. Uh, and it comes back on. While that part of their brain is inactive, you can give them a, a battery of tests, right? And see where they've got some sort of deficit. And then you can say, oh, that part of your brain must be responsible for whatever. Okay? That really started this, uh, it's called experimental ablation. This all started with Pierre Florenz. He was the first guy to do that. Based on his work, we figured out what part of the brain controls heart rate, breathing, movements, uh, visual reflexes, auditory reflexes, right? So he actually helped us figure out a lot of information about uh, what different parts of the brain are doing. Up until him, we didn't realize that different parts of your brain are actually responsible for different functions, right? If you were to just look at a brain, it looks like a piece of chewed up juicy fruit, right? Like, well, that's all just like a big wad of gum. That just must all do whatever. It's all the same, right? It looks homogenous, but it's not. All right, we already talked about that. Not long after Florenz, we had this great guy, Paul Broca. Uh, Paul was a surgeon, and basically he took the idea of experimental ablation and applied it to humans. This does, yeah, don't give me that look. This does not mean he like went around and like jumped on people's backs and was like cutting out pieces of their brain, right? There were not, same as today, a lot of folks signing up for that. If any of you know someone though, Jacob and I will uh, we'll take your name and we'll contact those folks later. So, uh, rather than going out and removing someone's brain tissue and then going, hey, can you still walk? Uh, what someone would do is they would come to him. He was a surgeon. So, folks would come to him with problems. He would study them, give them tests for a period of time. And then when they died, he would crack open their head and take a look at their brain. Sort of the most... Uh, famous example of this was a, was a man named Tam. The reason he was named Tam is because that's the only word he could say. So he just continually said Tam, Tam, Tam all the time. Uh, so there you go. Uh, this was in the 1860s. Broca actually did an autopsy on Tam. Found out that he actually lost part of his uh, cerebral cortex toward the front on the left side of the brain. We now call that area Broca's area. Situated right here. And there's another Paul Broca. Uh, this is after he won Sideburn of the Year. Uh, it's an important competition back there in the 1860s. I think there's actually still pieces of Tam's brain in there uh, after, he, after he chopped it up. So we have Broca's area. This is the part of the brain that was damaged with Tam. Tam had had a stroke, and that part of his brain had been damaged. Uh, how many of you have heard of Broca's aphasia? Yeah, we'll talk a good bit about Broca's aphasia in this class uh, when we get to the language and communication chapters. But uh, it was Broca and his approach 
that really gave us that information, right? So we, we, we were able to get that. Uh, we still do, there are other sort of similar cases of this. How many of you have heard of HM? The, uh, we'll talk about HM when we get to learning and memory. HM, uh, he had to have part of his temporal lobes removed, which are kind of out in here. They were actually removed his hippocampus, and the guy had no ability to create new memories, right? So it was kind of an interesting situation. You mentioned that before in another class. Oh. I was like, well, that's bad. If I got a TA that can't form any new memories. <laughs> oh, did you, did you, did he teach you our intro class? Oh, well, that's going to be great. We'll see how. Yeah, I'll see how. If she, if she does poorly on the exams, we'll know who to blame. Because it's not going to be me. Uh, so, HM, um, he actually just, just died a few years ago. I mean, he died recently. So we actually learned a lot. And we'll talk about HM when we talk about learning and memory. Hey, look at this great guy. Um, if you're ever, like, you know, needing a glamour shot uh, or, like, you know, graduation photos, the best thing to ever use as a prop, and they don't do this a lot these days, but you guys should start bringing it back. It's always a set of frog legs that have been peeled. Uh, I mean, that will, that will class up any photograph you've ever seen, right? So just get you some frog legs right there. And then you've got to get an electrode, too, because you're getting ready to zap. Or you're not going to eat it. I don't know if any of you ever have ever eaten frog legs. Uh, don't make that face. Frog legs are delicious. Uh, so there you go. I think you guys should bring back the frog legs as as a photo prop. But you know, it's, it's up to you. Galvani, uh, Luigi Galvani. How many of you've heard of galvanized metal? Yeah, right. That's named after Luigi Galvani. How many of you've ever had a lie detector test? We'll know. We can tell. <laughs> Uh, they, they, uh, a lot of that's on the galvanic skin response, right? It's also named after Luigi Galvani. Uh, the galvanic skin response, if you get a little stressed, you get a little nervous, you start to lie a little bit, you'll start to sweat. Like you'll get these little micro beads of sweat and your skin conductance will change, right? And then you can measure that change in conductance and know if somebody's telling the truth. So that's, uh, that's how that works. But Galvani had this idea. You know what? I mean, he just got bored one day. I think he's like, Hey, I got this electrode and I've got a frog. Let's see what happens. So he actually used the electrode to zap frog legs. Now, can you imagine what happens if you apply an electrical current to a frog leg? Same thing that happens if you apply an electrical current to your leg, right? It's gonna it's gonna twitch, right? It's gonna contract. Okay. It's not surprising to us. When Luigi Galvani did it, it was pretty surprising, right? Because this was centuries ago, right? That, that he did this. Uh, but what he really demonstrated was that electricity um, is is what you know kind of powers the those muscle contractions, right? Now this is super awesome because we just found out too. This is like mind blowing. We just found out. Remember that guy Johann Mueller, and he said nerves are carrying electrical impulses, and then now we figure out like man, your legs run on electrical impulses as well, muscles. So that's pretty awesome that your nervous system can have a chat with your uh, muscular system, right? They're speaking the same language there, electrical currents. That's pretty cool. Uh, and because they're both speaking the same language, guess what? Your nervous system can tell your muscles to do things, which is very important uh, for you folks in about an hour and 10 minutes when you're going to tell your like legs to get you out of here, right? So you've got Galvani. Um, it looks like he's a happy guy. I mean, look at that nice little smile he's got there. All right, so we're still moving along. We're not very far along. We're in 1870 now, right? Uh, you've got these two guys, these two German physiologists. They actually had an interesting idea. They thought, well, okay, so we know it's electricity, right? We know electricity is running your, your nervous system. We know it's running your muscles. All right, that seems important. Uh, but they discovered something that is so fundamental to how we understand how our nervous system is uh, organized that I think most people take it for granted at this point, right? But up until like 1870, we didn't know this. We did not know that the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and vice versa, right? So what they did is they applied a weak electrical current to the surface of the dog's brain, right? And they would see what happened. So what they did is they uh, applied that current again to the left side and then the right leg would start moving or they applied 
the current to the right side of the brain, and then the left leg was sunk. So either way it worked, that's, uh, that's how they would do that. So again, up until 1870, we had no idea how that works, right? We think about now that that's, uh, that's a basic concept of nervous system organization, right? That left-right decussation. We didn't know that uh, until 1870. Now, this guy, all seriousness right here. This guy is blasting you with science eyes, I promise, right? This is Hermann von Helmholtz. And Hermann von Helmholtz, man, this guy was on it constantly, okay? He actually developed a mathematical formulation for the law of the conservation of energy. That's a big one in and of itself, right? How many of you have ever been to the eye doctor? I can tell because you're wearing glasses. Uh, so you should just raise your hands if you're wearing glasses. If you're not, you've probably still been to the eye doctor. He actually invented the ophthalmoscope, right? That's the thing that they shine in your eye to take a look at your retina. So that's pretty awesome, right? So he invented that. He also devised a lot of theories related to color vision and color blindness. We'll talk about those later when we get into uh, talk about vision. It's going to be sort of an important thing that we think about. He also studied audition, music, and other physiological processes, right? This guy was all over the place. Everything he touched, he was right on it. I mean, he was just a really influential guy. I mean, look at this. You don't see this guy messing around with frog legs, right? Look at that seriousness. That's a very serious mustache. He's not got goofy sideburns, right? Nothing to make fun of you. I mean, he's just got just the right furrow in his brow. So you know, like if you ask him a question, he's going to give you a brusque but correct answer, right? So Hermann von Helmholtz, very important. He was also the first scientist to measure the speed of conduction through nerves. Prior to this point, people had still not shaken off the idea that I'm a philosopher, right? They had still not shaken off that I can just think myself to an answer sort of approach to life, right? But Helmholtz was pushing people away from that even more. Most folks at this time, uh, or at Helmholtz's time, thought that conduction in your nerves was the same as the speed of conduction in wires, right? So if you take a copper wire and you apply an electrical current on one end and you measure how quickly it goes to the other end, it's actually pretty close to the speed of light. And that's really fast, right? Now, your nervous system, just as a heads up in case you were not aware of this, does not operate at the speed of light, right? How many of you have ever been hit in the face? By anything? Yeah. Your nervous system doesn't work at the speed of light. It doesn't even work at like the speed of a baseball, right? Because it didn't get up there fast enough to catch it before it hit you. Okay. Helmholtz found that conduction is about 90 feet per second. Now that's still really fast, right? We're talking a couple hundred miles an hour, okay? So we're not, uh, you know, we're not slow, but by no means are we close to the speed of light. Anybody know what the number for the speed of light is? It's a lot. That's the, that's the technical uh, amount of speed for the speed of light, a lot. Questions about Helmholtz? Why it's important to measure things and not just take a guess? Jacob, are you a hockey fan? Somewhat. Somewhat, yeah. So I had this discussion a few years ago. Uh, I'll tell you the importance of measuring things and like not just thinking your way through things. So I had this discussion with some colleagues of mine, right? So we, I had this guy who was like, history PhD, I had a guy who was an electrical engineer, I was there, right? And we were uh, having a chat about how thick we thought the ice had to be on an ice rink, right? Because, you know, we're thinking like, these guys probably weigh a couple hundred pounds, you know, they've got all that equipment on there, they're moving really fast, they're digging in, man, that ice, and then we thought, well, it can't be too thick because we got to think about how quickly it's got to freeze, right? So we're thinking, I don't know, we thought like an inch and a quarter or something, right? No, that's what it's got to be. So we like spent like 40 minutes having this conversation and then one guy was like, why don't we just go to NHL.com and like see if it will tell us. And I was like, oh, that's brilliant. It's like three-eighths of an inch. <laughs> it's, like, it's like super, I know it's like super thin, right? Which is surprising. Uh, but really you should just measure things instead of just thinking about them, right? So it happens. Don't worry about it. All right. Uh, so let's move ahead a little bit, right? We finally crossed over into the 1900s. So we're just flying along with progress here. Uh, you've got this guy, Purkinje. Purkinje, we'll talk about Purkinje cells in the um, cerebellum later when we talk about like movement and coordinated movements and so forth. You also have Purkinje fibers in your heart, right? Kind of keep your heart beating. Most of you should try to keep your heart beating. Thankfully, most of you don't have to think about that. 
your brain, a long time ago, evolved something I refer to as the idiot box. Uh, and that's the brain stem. Those are the important things, right, that keep you breathing and your heart pumping and those sort of things. Because as soon as one of you is responsible for that, you're going to die. If you have to consciously think about your heart beating, I guarantee half of you are going to keel over. And that's keel with a double E, by the way, because it's referring to a boat. Just to let you know, it's not kill over. So just correct that in your life because that's an annoyance to me. It's keel over, so the boat, right? So if you have a boat, this part is known as the keel, right? And so if you've keeled over, right, your boat has flipped and you're drowning. That's a true story. Why those things bother me, I don't know. But they do. Anybody call it kill over like this? Admit to it, because you know you have. Yeah, it's kill. I promise. All right. Hey, who wants to hear about a weirdo? All right. Uh, so we're going to talk about Cajal. Uh, Cajal, he won the Nobel Prize in 1906. That's pretty impressive, right? He won that Nobel Prize again. As I said, he used something called the Golgi stain. There was this other guy named Golgi who developed sort of this way that we could stain brain cells and look at them under a microscope, right? That was exciting. Uh, so Cajal was able to, to do that, and so what we could see were these brain cells. You don't need to know what these parts are just yet, but I'll tell you at some point. And so... Cajal said, it's individual neurons. <clears throat> the Nobel folks said, here's a medallion. That was awesome. That's how that works. That's how easy it is. That's how easy it is to get a Nobel Prize. All you've got to do is figure out brain cells are independent and discrete. That was it. Of course, you had to do it, you know, like 112 years ago. Now, that's going to be the hard part for you. Uh, but, but otherwise, it's pretty simple. So I didn't tell you the weird part about Cajal. Cajal, obviously, to, to take these beautiful images, he had to be sort of a fan of photographs, right? So we're going to just draw a camera here. He's using an old-style camera. I'm sure there's like a curtain back here. And he's in there taking a picture. Uh, so not only was Cajal a big fan of cameras, he was a big fan of brothels as well. Um, and so he would hire prostitutes. Again, this is not terribly weird. Right? There are a number of people who hire prostitutes. Okay, So we've not really reached like a weird level yet. But he would hire the prostitutes to dress up in costumes. Again, we're not quite at the weird point yet. And he would just take pictures of them. So he was such like a big patron of the brothels in his hometown. When he died <clears throat> and they went through with the funeral procession, all the brothels shut down and they, they were hanging black curtains in the windows uh, in honor of Cajal. So there you see that's a fun story, isn't it? I mean, it's like you don't get these stories elsewhere. People just say, Cajal, he was awesome, Nobel Prize. Nobody says such a patron of brothels that they shut down for the day when he died. I thought it was interesting. See, here's what I, I like about this story. I like that this guy won a Nobel Prize. That's pretty impressive, right? But then he had this other thing about him too, right? And so how many of you are sitting out there and you're thinking like, well, maybe you're not thinking I like to take pictures of prostitutes, but you're thinking something else, right? Like, well, I've got this problem or, you know, I've, I've got this issue I'm dealing with or maybe I didn't come from this place or that place. This guy still won a Nobel Prize. You can too, right? So I really like to show you whenever we talk about these folks, I don't like to present them as these like, you know, deified individuals and they're all like magnificent up on a pedestal. They're just regular dudes, right? Uh, yeah, he won a Nobel Prize. He also took pictures of prostitutes, you know, dressed up in weird costumes. Um, by the way, they were like PG costumes too, right? You're thinking like if you're going to hire prostitutes to take pictures of them, they're going to be in like X-rated costumes. Not really. So, <clears throat> so there you go. I would wait until you get home to search for those pictures because you don't know like what will pop up on the university internet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you ever think about that? Like, <clears throat> I type in things sometimes that I need to find pictures for, and I'm like, three like rows down on Google Images, there's something I don't need to be looking at at work. All right. So we move into the 20th century. Awesome. 
we start to focus more on electrical and chemical messages. We start to think about brain circuits and brain structures. We start dealing with treatments for disorders, but we're thinking about those and how we're going to treat your brain, right? How we're going to change your brain so that it will uh, alter your behavior. This is, this is where we're going to live for this class, all right? We're going to think about those electrical and chemical messages. We're going to think about those brain circuits that are responsible for behavior, all that kind of fun stuff. Now, move into the 21st century, we get better imaging, right? Okay. <clears throat> um, so Jacob, I always have this moment where there's like always these lines, right, that you should or should not cross, right? And so most of the time I ignore them, right? So I, I just told you the story about like the prostitutes, right, and the Nobel Prize winner. Uh, but sometimes there are lines I think, like, well, maybe I'm not going to cross that line, I don't know. So I always have this internal debate. It's just a side story. <clears throat> So, uh, into the 21st century, some cool things happened. Actually, the 2014 Nobel Prize went to uh, this group uh, headed by Edvard and uh, his then wife, they've since been divorced, uh, Moser and uh, John O'Keefe. We'll actually talk about these folks later. Uh, they won a Nobel Prize in 2014 for figuring out this thing called grid cells, which is pretty awesome. So. They would like put a rat in a box and the rat would like move around and when it got to different places certain brain cells would get active and so they figured out like how the rat and how your brain actually like makes a map of the world as you move around in it which is actually pretty awesome right it's pretty exciting uh a few years ago there was also this awesome thing called the brain initiative uh, initiative i don't know if you guys remember this uh, this was uh, an administration ago when uh president uh, obama at the time said hey brains are awesome I'm gonna give you guys money to like figure out how much more awesome brains are. So that was kind of cool, right? So there was like a ton of money that got dumped onto folks who were developing new uh, techniques to study the brain, right? New imaging techniques, uh, new uh, other new approaches. Since then, we've actually had some amazing developments in the way that we can visualize the brain. Microscopy has, has really advanced a lot. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a really interesting development We'll talk a little bit about, um, well actually this is probably like 10 years ago, there's a thing called optogenetics. Anybody heard of this? It's like a cool story, I'm gonna tell you this because we're not gonna talk much about methods, but we should talk about optogenetics. So how many of you love viruses? No, nobody loves viruses, right? Uh, but viruses are interesting because they can easily get into, this is how a virus works. It'll get into your cells and then it'll start making copies that like it'll trick that cell into making copies of its own DNA eventually that cell is going to explode that's a whole different story right and those DNA copies go out all over the place and they infect other cells right and that's generally how that process works if you cut off the part of the virus that like makes extra copies and explodes uh, and then you just have a really great way to get inside of a cell and you can like insert DNA into that cell right so the cool thing that these guys did Carl DeSaroth and Ed Boyden um, they developed optogenetics. They had a virus, cut off the part that makes you sick, left the part that gets into your cells. They put a little bit of DNA in there so they can make an ion channel that works, uh, that's instead of opens and closes based on neurotransmitters, which is what we'll, we'll mostly talk about, it opens and closes uh, based on light. So if you shine light on it, it'll open or close, right? which is pretty awesome. So they did this with lasers. So this story gets even better now because we're putting lasers in your brain, right? just when you thought it was going to get boring, just with infecting you with a virus and altering your DNA, we're also going to shoot you with a laser. So they developed this way to make these ion channels that will open and close with a laser light, right? So you hit them with a laser. And you can put a laser in your brain. Uh, it's a fiber optic, right? You just like poke that right in your brain, and then it'll like, you know, shoot a little bit of a laser beam out into your brain, just a little bit. Uh, now they've actually got LEDs that are really powerful, and you can do this with LEDs now. Uh, so I, I think about like these cool, like, I'm, th I'm thinking about patenting an LED hat, right? Because I'm thinking like, you know, what's bad for you is ecstasy. Um, but what's not so bad for you is maybe thinking you're on ecstasy just by activating your brain cells with LED, right? So what if I was marketing to people, right? This DNA that got into your brain cells and then you just put on this hat, but I could have the LED shine in and out, right? So it's like your own portable rave. Say, Taylor, I'm really thinking about this. So you've got this hat right there's like all these different like bits of light coming in and out which is going to be exciting right but then there's also like the lights coming in and activating your brain so you're having some sort of 
uh, experience from that. It's going to be cool. Watch out. It's going to be on the Home Shopping Network probably in six months. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so this is actually pretty awesome. We'll never use this in people, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, because a few years after that, somebody said, that's awesome, but what if I were to just kind of do the same thing, but instead um, I make it open and closed based on a chemical you've never had in your body before, and then you just take a pill, right? And then you can open and close it. So uh, that's much better, right, because you don't have to drill holes in people's heads. So you could just take a pill, and then it could activate these ion channels, which is going to be pretty exciting. That we'll probably use in people soon. Uh, they're doing it in rats. Might be doing it in monkeys by now. But the laser hat, I mean, it's mostly for show. All right. Uh, what's a big push right now is uh, in neuroscience is diversity. If you notice, like, all those folks I talked about, and I could have talked about more, there was, like, one female in that whole list, right? So that's not a lot of diversity. Uh, most of these are, like, European guys. Again, not a lot of diversity. So there are some groups that are really working on this. One of those is the Society for Neuroscience. It's kind of a cool group. They meet in cool places every year for their annual convention, uh, like Guy and Dot. So they meet, no. Um, anybody from Guy and Dot? Nobody, nobody's going to admit to that now, right? They meet in cool places like San Diego, D.C., Chicago, right? They have like 30,000 people get together, and they're like, hey, let's just talk about brains. It's pretty cool. Uh, one year they had the Dalai Lama came and gave a talk. That's pretty awesome. One year they had Glenn Close who came and, and gave a chat. Uh, they always have these kind of like big public dialogue things. Uh, they had um, I don't know. I think it's Joseph Kennedy the uh, third who came a couple of years ago and was was talking about you know uh, you know uh, politics and, and healthcare and brain science and things. Uh, a lot of what they're trying to do right now is they're trying to push uh, getting more women and underrepresented groups excited about brains and excited about studying brains, so that's a cool thing. Uh, I think the more we can do that, the better. All right, questions about that before we move on to something different. Hey, who wants an art lesson? See, I gave you like this whole history lesson. Now I'm going to give you an art lesson. How many of you are familiar with the creation of Adam as, um, as painted by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? Nobody? That's really disappointing. Yes, yes, right? So, hey, I think I gotta throw out a warning. Uh, and you should check on this. I'm gonna show you a picture of a naked man. <laughs> so, is that, am I, am I required to tell you that? I don't know. I know what it is. I was wondering if you could, like, give a like, secret mystery. Yeah, there is a secret mystery to this. Uh, and here's the secret mystery. So, when Michelangelo was doing it, probably one of the most talented artists of all time, right? When you start to think about his body of work, and he was working in, in a, uh, you know, a 2D media, he, he worked in 3D, I mean, he, the sculpting, he really accurately portrayed the human body, right? And it's really difficult to have that sort of concept of the human body if you've not, like, I was getting ready to say something, but I'm going to edit that. If you've not, like, dissected one, I was going to say if you've not been inside one, but that might have <laughs> implied the wrong thing. Uh, might not have been accurate for what I was trying to say here. So if you've not actually seen the inner workings of the human body, it's really hard to represent that, right? If you're thinking about like surface anatomy, those of you who have taken anatomy and physiology, right? You know about surface anatomy. So to think about the way the muscles and the bones are represented, right? So Michelangelo was very, very talented at this. This is probably one of his most famous paintings is um, the uh, creation of Adam. So this is uh, his representation of God. This is Adam kind of down here, as you can see. What's really interesting about this, if you look at this, I don't know what this is. It's like God's cave or something. Um, I'm not really certain. Somebody's cave. But that's, if you look at that, it's like really the outline of the human brain, right? And so if you look at it, like actually next to a human brain, it's really hard not to see like the massive similarities of parallels there, right? So you can, it's um, even more obvious if you see sort of the inside of it. But you can see like the brain stem coming out here. I mean, this is just... Um, sort of an unbelievable, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I mean, here you have the corpus callosum coming around with the arm, which is actually white. If you cut open a brain, it's actually white matter because it's fiber tracks. It actually looks uh, like it's white, like reaching around like this. You sort of have uh, different parts of the brain represented, which I think is impressive. 
right? Uh, this is sort of, I think, Michelangelo's middle finger to the Catholic Church. At the time, the Catholic Church said, you know, it's not cool to cut people open. Um, and he said, well, this is what he said. Uh, he said, you want something awesome on your ceiling? I'm going to put it up there. But people are going to look at it forever. Uh, and it's going to be a human brain with God in the middle, which is kind of cool. And here's somebody who really spent, like, a, a lot of time, like, you know, talking about the cerebellum and all these other parts. So, I don't know. There's your art lesson. I hope you found that interesting. Maybe, maybe not. Gives you a new appreciation for art. Now you're going to walk around and try to, like, find all the body parts, you know, all the uh, classical works. I don't know. Anybody have to take an art history class? I know some of you did. Like a fine arts class. Really? I thought cola people had to take that. Sorry, what was that, Sean? Oh, okay. They didn't teach you cool stuff like that. No. You should go back and say, I want my money back. They didn't teach me about this brain thing. Because that would have been awesome. All right. So, uh... That's, all, that's a really nice place to like segue into something else, right? So we're going to kind of shift over. We need to talk about natural selection and evolution just a little bit so you can have an understanding of uh, our species, the other species that we're going to talk about, right? So we want to think about these sort of in there. Um, I think this is important. If you're going to do a study on an animal, and humans are animals just as a heads up, you should really understand that animal's like natural habitat, right? And to understand that natural habitat, you have to really think about, right? Like what's its evolutionary history? So if you're going to study rats and you want to like ask a rat to do something, right? So you might decide I'm going to ask a rat to do something. You really need to think about like what are the actual capabilities of this rat? How did these capabilities develop over time? And if I'm asking that rat to do something that's appropriate or not, right? So this kind of brings up an interesting story. Uh, who loves elephants? All right. That was sort of the most excitement I've seen out of you. Uh, so elephants are... are extremely intelligent animals, right? We'll talk a little bit about elephants later. There's actually a test they do, and uh, chimpanzees can do it, little kids can do it, humans, you know, adults can do it. Basically, what you've got to do is you've got to put somebody to sleep, like gas them a little bit, right? So this is definitely something you can just do without asking. So, you know, you just, like, hit them with a little chloroform, knock them down. Uh, then what you want to do is you want to put, like, some red lipstick on them, right? And not where they can see it, like on their forehead. And then, like, make sure there's a mirror in front of them. And so then when they wake up and they look in the mirror, what they should do, because you know, like, that's me in the mirror, you should start rubbing your own forehead, right? Most of you, I hope, when you're, like, brushing your teeth in the morning, which I hope you do, uh, you don't, like, like, a little toothpaste on it, so, like, rubbing the mirror, right? You don't do that, okay? Little kids don't do that. Chimpanzees don't do that. You can put it, you can gas a chimpanzee, put it down, put a red mark on its forehead, show it a mirror, it's going to rub it off on its own forehead, not on the mirror, right? So they said, hey, if there's any other animal that can do this, it's got to be an elephant, right? Because elephants are really bright. They really are. Elephants have never been able to show that they could do this, right? Here was the problem. You guys have seen elephants, right? They were using little mirrors. They gave these elephants these little mirrors, like this big, you know, like little like, like, like uh, closet mirrors, right? And so what can the elephant see out of that? It's got a leg. That's it, right? So the elephant was never able to actually see its head right in this mirror. So finally they said, okay, we'll give the elephant a big mirror and we'll see what happens. You give the elephant a big mirror, guess what? It rubs the mark off its own head. It understands that's me. That's my reflection. So that's really, really actually amazing if you think about it, right? That like some other animal has some comprehension that that's my own reflection and I can manipulate my own body by using that mirror, right? You don't think about how, how cool that is because you do it every day, right? You just take advantage of that. Uh, so I think it's really important to think about, like, are we asking something appropriate of that animal before we make a judgment, right? So that was a little side story, but still a fun one. All right, so functionalism. We should think about functionalism. If we're really wanting to understand uh, a biological phenomenon, we really should think about how is it useful? What's it do for the organism? What is its function, right? Now, the interesting thing about this is, if the environment changes, you may no longer, you may not be using that, that entity, that phenomenon, whatever it is, for its original function, right? How many of you have a screwdriver at home that the tip has been broken off because you tried to use it as a crowbar? 
Yeah, right, David? I, I, everybody's, I got like five at home, right? I don't know what I do with them now. I just like throw them at the wall because they're useless, right? Okay. The function of that was to operate a, a slotted screw, right? The function of that was not to, you know, like open your car door. But that's what you used it for, right? I'm assuming. I don't know what it was for. Uh, and that's fine. That works sometimes, right? A great example today is how many of you have, you don't have to raise your hand on this. I'm going to throw that out first. How many of you have or you, you know someone who has like some attention problems or some impulse problems, right? I think we all probably do, right? That's a, that's a fairly common thing. It's been a common thing throughout the history of our species. That's awesome. I say it's awesome. It's not really that awesome in this class, right? So you're going to sit here for like two hours and 20 minutes. Uh, I probably should have told him, Jacob, I don't take breaks. Uh, so if you need to take a break, feel free to do so and then just come back, please. Or not, because we'll take attendance. It doesn't matter. Uh, so, if you um, have an attention problem today, that might be difficult to sit through a two hour and 20 minute class, right? Okay. What that was not difficult to do was to like sit around a fire and, you know, get caught off guard by a, by a pack of jackals or something, right? Okay. So, if you're sitting around a fire and you are a very contemplative individual and you're like really getting, really getting into the, the the hues and the reds and the, the licking of the flames upon the air, right? And the swirls of smoke and the, the way the ash just spirals toward the heavens. And the next thing you know, your head's gone. Because uh, you should have been listening to what that noise was, right? And your buddy was like, hey man, what's that? And he turned around with a torch, right? Nobody ate him. And then he had sex with like your great, 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 great something or other grandmother and here you are today. And that's why you can't pay attention to me. Uh, so, you just got to deal with it, right? That's kind of interesting, right? If you think about that. We are all the descendants of people with short attention spans. Because if they had long attention spans, they would have been eaten. Right? So, there you go. You got to be a little jumpy. All right. So, that's kind of functionalism. Uh, natural selection. What do we want to think about there? This is great. Uh, you get inherited traits. This usually comes from your parents. Actually, it always comes from your parents, right? And it's the only way you can get things that are inherited. Uh, if, it's, if it gives you a selective advantage, right? And then that DNA, that, that gene can become more prevalent in future populations, right? So how does this work? How do you get more of your DNA into the next generation? You have to have a lot more sex. Uh, that's exactly how this works, right? And so you have to have more offspring. Okay. Now, I'm going to recommend that none of you have kids. That's just me. right? If you already have kids, you, I, you can't put them back. Uh, trust me. I, it's, I saw it on YouTube. You can't do it. Uh, you know, but save your money. Save your time. Don't have kids. People think, like, kids are going to like, take care of me when I'm old. No, they're not. Not at all. I promise you they're not. Thankfully. My mom's thankful I got three siblings because I think they had me and they were like, well, this one looks like a dud. We'll have to try again. We get somebody we think will take care of us. So, natural selection. You want an advantage. What is that advantage? It could be anything. That advantage could give you, uh, could make you just a little bit faster. Right? So maybe you can get to a food source more quickly or get away from a danger. Right? Okay, so that's going to make it more likely. If uh, you and your buddy are out and you're a little faster than your buddy and you take off running and he gets eaten, uh, you know, then, uh, whoa, guess what? You could have more kids than he does. Uh, that's how that works, right? So, so keep that in mind. So we want to have that selective advantage, whatever that is. <clears throat> okay. Anything else we want to think about with that? I don't know. It's kind of interesting. It doesn't have to be a big advantage, right? It doesn't have to be a big advantage. It could be a big advantage. So, actually, if you think about sort of the evolution of the human species, if you go back a few species uh, from which we evolved, there was a, a like a branch point, right? And one of those hominids, they could digest like one type of grass, and then the other branch could digest two types of grass. Right, so what's better than one type of grass is two types. And I know this because one of those types of grass died. And when that type of grass died, guess what? Those other things died, 
right? And not the branch that, that ended up with us, right? And so as the environment changes, if you're not able to adapt to that, then um, you're gone. That's how, how life works. Hey, who loves Chuck D? Everybody loves Charles Darwin, right? I like to call him Chuck D. It just makes him more hip, right? <clears throat> I think I'm the only person who calls him that, but you guys are welcome to start. Charles Darwin, <coughs> he was the first guy to think about, uh, probably wasn't the first guy to think about, he was the first guy to really get information out there about the theory of evolution. There was another guy that published at the same time as him, Wallace. Uh, Wallace had his ideas like 20 years after Darwin. Darwin had his ideas, didn't publish them. He was afraid to publish those ideas. <clears throat> there were other folks who were thinking about evolution at that time. Darwin really built a lot of his work off of some geologists and this other guy, Alexander von Humboldt. You guys should think about von Humboldt. He's kind of a cool dude. Um, all the same, Darwin really, really gets the... Uh, the notoriety here, largely because he continued to publish, right? And he continued to come up with ideas and really write down things. Uh, not only did he do The Origin of Species, I mean, he did um, like Descent of Man. He, he talked about emotions. He was one of the first folks to talk about like animal emotions and how that relates to human emotions, which is really kind of fascinating that he was thinking about these things in the 1800s, right? And even today, people are like, ah, we don't want to talk about that. Right? Uh, he had a buddy. <clears throat> this guy's kind of cool. His name's Thomas Henry Huxley. This guy, uh, his na he, he, he had a nickname, and that nickname was Darwin's Bulldog. I don't know. I just think if you're going to pick up a nickname, Darwin's Bulldog's kind of a cool one, right? Looking for a new tattoo. Be great on your forearm. Uh, I, I, I don't know why, but it just would. And then you could actually even do, like, T.H. Huxley's face. Just, like, giving you some ideas. I drove by some tattoo shop today. They're having a flash sale, like thirty or forty dollar tattoos. So if you need to run down and get that, yeah. No, seriously. I, yeah, I don't know. I was thinking about that, right? Is that just gonna be like, like an express low quality job? I don't know, right? So it's really like that puzzled me as I continued to drive to work today. So T. H. Huxley. Why is his last name important? Uh, the whole Huxley family tree is pretty impressive, starting with Thomas Henry Huxley. He had a couple of amazing uh, grandsons, one of which we'll actually talk about in this class who won a Nobel Prize. That's pretty cool. He had another amazing grandson. How many of you have read Brave New World? How many of you should have read Brave New World? That, all the rest of your hands should go up. That's an amazing book. Aldous Huxley, uh, also a grandson. Huh? I know the name. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great book. You should, it's, it's a short book. You should really spend some time with it. Uh, so the whole Huxley family tree, he's got a son who uh, worked with the United Nations really developed a lot of things there. Uh, he's got another grandson that developed the World Wildlife uh, Fund, which is kind of cool, right? So it's a pretty influential family. And these ideas uh, that Darwin had, they were really important, uh, obviously for biology, but also psychologists were really, you know, uh, influenced by these ideas. Uh, <coughs> I don't think we need to worry about four limbs. We do want to think, though, about how do we get these um, inherited traits? How do we get that selective advantage? Most of this occurs through mutations, right? Most mutations are not helpful. In fact, most mutations will end you before you even start, right? Most mutations are actually uh, non-viable, okay? So if you have a significant enough mutation, Guess what? Nothing's going to happen. End of story. Try again. Other mutations are rather benign. They're not really going to give you any sort of advantage. You know, they're not really going to help you out any. <clears throat> when you get a mutation that gives you that selective advantage, maybe you're better able to digest food sources. Maybe you are, uh, you know, more attractive in some way or another to the opposite sex. So you're, you have more uh, sexual partners, so you can procreate more. That, uh, that DNA is going to make it into the next generation, and then those offspring are going to spread that DNA, right? It just kind of works, uh, works like that. And that's how evolution works. Over time, enough uh, percentage of the population has that awesome selective advantage. Guess what? You need a new selective advantage then, right? So you have to continually drive the species uh, to, to outperform other competitors. Evolution is this gradual change, structure and physiology of plants and animals. Not a big deal. 
We've talked about that. This statement is not really true. It's mostly true. We'll mark it out just so you don't get confused. Uh, there are instances where evolution will produce uh, more simple organisms. The whole point here is not, there's not an end goal, right? So this is like a never ending race, right? There's like no end. And so if you want to ask the question like, which species is more evolved, humans or rats? Right? There's like no real answer to that, right? And the reason there's no real answer to that is because we're like equally well suited to procreate and to eat, right? So if you think about that, rats are just about everywhere, people are just about everywhere, so we're both doing pretty good. So we're fine, right? So there's not really a, uh, a winner there. All the result in natural selection. Now why are we talking about all of that? I want to set you up because we want to talk about brains, right? Because brains are exciting. That's why you're all here. Or because your advisor said to. One of the two. If we wanted to think about which species is smarter, right? and so this is maybe something I don't know. You want to you want to have a real debate about this. The first thing you might go is like, if you've got a bigger brain, definitely you're going to be smarter. That's a great place to start. The problem with that is that human brains are kind of small if you compare that to an elephant or a whale. Now elephants and whales are very smart. Okay. Not knocking the intelligence of the whale there, but probably from everything we can tell, not quite uh, as, as intelligent as the human species in general, right? Okay. So then the next thing you think is, okay, well, obviously if you're bigger, you're gonna have a bigger brain. Maybe what we wanna think about is uh, proportionality, right? So maybe if you're bigger, but your brain is smaller relative to your body, you're not as smart as somebody who's smaller, but has a bigger brain, right, in that ratio. So then we go, we think, okay, awesome. Humans, brains make up about 2.3% of your body. Uh, total body mass. For an elephant, it's about 0.2%. So we're thinking, okay, there we go, right? That's the relationship we want until you start thinking about shrews. Shrews are these little guys, right? And they have brains that are about 3.3% of their total body weight. That's more than humans. That's a whole lot more than elephants. And I'll tell you, an elephant's a lot smarter than a shrew. Uh, and humans are a good bit smarter than shrews, right? Even though our brains take up slightly less space relative to our total body. So then we're left with like this real puzzle, right? Who is smarter? <clears throat> the best way really to do this is, is, it doesn't matter how big your brain is, it matters what you put in there, right? How many of you, uh, you know, you think about a suitcase, how many of you see these people with these like giant suitcases and you know all they've got in there is like a pair of swim trunks and some sandals, right? And then you see this guy who gets off and he just had one carry-on, right? And you know he's got like a three-piece suit in there. He's probably got two sweaters, right? A pair of running shoes and like a small dog, right? And it's all in this little thing, right? And so it's like, it's about packing density, right? And for us, we really want to think about neurons, okay? These are the guys that are really doing the calculations. There are other support cells, we'll talk about those as we get there, but we really want to think about these guys doing the calculations. And in particular, we want to think about neurons in a, in a particular place, the cortex. Now, guess what a lizard can do? It can breathe, its heart pumps, okay? Birds, same story. Rats, they've got it too. So we should subtract off that part of the brain, right? Because everybody's got that part of the brain. We want to think about the other part of the brain, right? We don't care how many neurons you've got in the part of your brain that says for your heart to beat, because your heart's going to beat, that's a basic function, right? We're looking just at the cortex, just at that outer kind of wrinkly part of the brain, right? And when we do this, what we find, it's not surprisingly, humans have the highest uh, packing density of neurons, right? So we've got more neurons packed in there than anybody else. If you bounce down just a little bit from that, you're going to think about apes other primates, elephants are going to be in here, mammals in general beat just about any other species and then you get down to things like birds or whatever, okay? So it, we want to think about what's inside, right? And again, we weren't able to do this a few years ago because we weren't able to actually, you know, kind of measure this, tell how many neurons were in a particular, you know, unit of space in our cortex, but we can do that now. It's kind of exciting. So why do humans need a large brain? This is a great question. 
<clears throat> and here are five pretty good reasons. Tool use is an obvious one, right? How many of you have ever used a tool? You're using one right now. If you've got a pencil in your hand, if you're wearing shoes, that's a tool, right? Because it's a, it's a device that's not you that solves a problem, okay? That's what a tool is, right? You don't see a lot of other species using tools. Some other species do. Elephants can use tools, chimpanzees, some other primates. Birds, a handful of birds can do that, right? You don't see your dog using a tool, right? There aren't a lot of dogs that are just like always like, you know, picking up a screwdriver and, you know, opening up a gate or anything, right? They can learn some things, but they're not like natural tool users. <clears throat> so tool use, and we use really advanced tools. Color vision, not one that you might think about. But if you only have one type of cone, and then all of a sudden I add two more, I've just like tripled the data streams that you're getting, right? So I have to triple kind of the brain space that's going to be devoted to color vision, right? So you have to have a bigger brain for that. Uh, language, and we're going to skip down here to language. <clears throat> that's sort of an easy one, too. We have a very complicated language as, as a human species. At least we think it's more complicated. I don't see a lot of people like, you know, talking to chipmunks to really know how complicated their language is, but I'm going to assume it's more complicated or less complicated than the human language. <clears throat> Fire is an interesting story. There's constantly this debate about whether or not cooking preceded giant brains, or we had giant brains before cooking, and then it was the giant brains that said, hey, we should start cooking, right? So this is kind of this debate, and it's hard to figure out, right, like which came first. So you're looking at these, like, uh, you know, extinct species, right, that were in the, the human lineage, and we're trying to figure out, like, hey, did they have, like, fire and cooking first, or did they get big brains first? Uh, so the reason we, we think about cooking is and fire is typically if you cook food, it's easier to digest, right, so you can pull more nutrients out of that. If you've got a giant brain, you've got to send a lot of nutrients to that, right? So, for example, about 25% of your blood supply at any given moment is going to your brain, right? That's a pretty big chunk of your blood supply that's headed somewhere, right? Okay, so and it's a big brain, so that's a lot. It's, uh, it's pulling, a lot of re pulling a lot of resources from elsewhere. So there's this guy in Australia who was like, well, I'm going to figure this out. This is an interesting story. It involves eating a raw goat. So, if you, I don't know, anybody interested in raw goat? No, nobody's interested in that. So, I'll tell you anyway, though, because it's exciting. This guy said, hey, I want to figure out, like, really... Because like, you can't just think about these things, you've got to do it. Is it easier to digest cooked food, or raw? is there a way that I can prepare raw food and it's easy to digest, right? And we can pull the same nutrients out, because then then we could that puts a different wrinkle on this, which came first, right? Cooking or big brains. So he, he got a goat, or a number of goats, and he put them in his lab so they could be sterile. Because again, you're not cooking this, right? And so uncooked meat carries awesome things, uh, like, you know, great flavor, I assume. Uh, but it also has things like parasites. And most people don't want parasites. There might be a few of you out there that do, but most people don't want parasites. So that's why you cook your meat. One reason. So he's got these sterile goats, and I don't mean sterile like they can't have more goats. I mean like sterile, they don't have parasites, right? So it's a different kind of sterile. In his lab. And then he's going to like, you know, obviously kill the goat and butcher it, right? So he's got to, got to butcher the goat. So he's thinking like, well, how am I going to butcher this? This guy's so hardcore, he actually uses stone tools, right? So he uses stone tools that are appropriate, right, uh, for, for the, the time period he's, he's interested in. So that's kind of cool. But he figures out if he chops the meat up small enough, it's just as easy to digest as cooked meat. Uh, so that really didn't answer whether cooking or fire uh, or uh, big brains came first. But he said, hey, <laughs> hey, at least it could go the other way, right? So he's, like, refuting that, you know, fire must have, we must have controlled fire before we had big brains. But uh, it's possible we had big brains first. We could have just cut up our goats really small. So I don't know. So if you want to eat raw food, uh, you know, just, just cut up the pieces really small. That's just a good life lesson. Just go home, you're in a hurry, you're like, man, I wish I had some chicken, but I don't want to cook it. Shred it. You'll be fine. Nobody's going to try that, are they? Uh, upright posture. This is one most people don't think about. This is quite honestly the single most important innovation in the history of the human species is the upright posture. As soon as our ancestors moved from four to two, the world changed for us. Right? And it changed for us because it did awesome things for us. 
So, how many of you have ever walked around on all fours? Just for fun. Go home and do it. Yeah, nobody wants not I mean just like, you know, just because, right? Just have you did it when you were a kid, right? Just assume that's when it was. So, remember that time I told you about tools? And I said, what are you gonna do with those tools? Well, have you ever been out and you just found like the greatest stick ever? And you're like, man, if I had this stick somewhere else, the things I could do, right? The things I could do with this stick, I could, uh, you know, pry up a rock and get a worm from underneath of there. I could beat someone over the head who's trying to take my, my food stash. Uh, I could use it to like stick in the ground. I don't know why I would want to do that, but I'm going to stick in the ground, right? There are all kinds of things you can do with an awesome stick. The problem is if you're on all fours, do you know how, like, how hard it is to take a stick from one place to another? It's difficult, right? As soon as you start walking upright, guess what you get? Two free hands. You know what you can do with two free hands? You can carry two sticks, as a matter of fact, right? So you can find a good stick and an okay stick, right? Like use that okay stick first. Carry a whole bundle of sticks, right? You can carry tools, you can gather food, right? And you can bring it back to some central location. You couldn't do this before if you're on all fours, right? It's just impossible, right? Okay, it's impossible to do. As soon as we move to two legs, whoa, world changed. The next thing it does is it puts you up above the grass, right? So, so we're out in the grasslands, right, in Africa, and we're just like looking out as a species. And now all of a sudden our head is above the grass. And do you know what you can see when your head gets above the grass? Something that's coming to eat you or something you want to eat, right? And you can see it in the distance. Okay? And you can make that, you can travel that distance. The next thing being upright does, when we went upright, we kind of narrowed our hips just a little bit, right? When we narrowed our hips, we actually became very efficient at running. The human species is perhaps one of the most efficient species for running. We don't typically think about how efficient we are at running, but we are, right? And I know somebody's going to say, well, what about that cheetah? You only have to outrun a cheetah for four seconds, and then it dies, right? Because they use so much energy in that short period of time. If they don't catch you, they give up. Seriously, true story. So you only really have to outrun a cheetah for a few seconds, and then you're okay. Uh, but humans can run massive distances. And think about this. Like, uh, how many of you have ever run a marathon? How many of you know an idiot who ran a marathon? Yeah, <laughs> you go, right? Uh, what about those ultra marathons? Those things are ridiculous, right? There's this great book called uh, Why We Run. It's by Bern Heinrich. I highly recommend this book. Bern Heinrich uh, got into running ultra marathons in his 40s, right? And so when he's like in his mid 40s, he wins the Chicago Ultra Marathon. He actually, for a while, held the record for the longest distance run in 24 hours. So in like 24 hours, he ran like 136 miles or something. Like 24 hours straight. That's impressive. I mean, I think he took breaks, right? But that's still impressive, right? As a species that we can run that far. And it's because we're on two legs and our, our hips are just a little bit narrower than they used to be, right? So our hips got narrower. That upright posture, man, the next thing it did is allow us to have pockets, which is also cool. So upright posture is probably uh, the secret to the success of the human species because you can start carrying things from one location to another. You can find a nice place to live and then you can go out and you can get food and come back, right? Prior to that upright posture, you really couldn't do that. You had to keep moving from new food source to new for food source, right? So you really, you really couldn't necessarily come back. It became, a, um, became much easier to do. Now, that's awesome. We wanted those narrow hips. We wanted to be able to run. We want that mobility, right? We want to be able to cover that distance. We also wanted giant brains. Giant brains were going to be helpful for us, right? If you think about humans versus gorillas, right? Uh, gorillas evolved down the path of, of strength, right? So if you think about a gorilla, the massive amount of strength that they have, their brains aren't as big as ours, right? Never try to out-strength uh, a gorilla. It's not going to happen. You can outsmart a gorilla, right? But you are not ever going to be able to outmuscle it, I promise you, okay? Gorillas are strong. Chimpanzees, in fact, are stronger than us, right? Don't, don't get in a fight with a chimpanzee. Those things are dangerous. <clears throat> So, this brings up the concept of neoteny. Neoteny is the slowing of the process of maturation, allows us more time for growth. This is really great so we can have large brains. Okay? How many of you have a mother? Everybody had a mother, right? That happened. Uh, I bet you could go ask any mother out there in the world, 
and you could ask them. You might get a different answer if you ask fathers. But if you ask mothers, would you like for your baby's brain to have been bigger when it was born? I would say most of them would say, I think it was about as big as it needed to be, right? And if you don't know why, think about the outspout there where babies come out, right? And think about if you would like to push a bigger brain out that hole. And I would say most people would say, no, I think the baby's brain was big enough, right? Okay, and you, you guys call your mom's ass. <clears throat> she might have even said, I'd like a little smaller brain, you know? He doesn't have to do that great. A little smaller brain, it'll be fine. Uh, so, we have large brains, but we don't want large hips because we still want that mobility, right? We still, as a species, want to have that kind of high mobility. Okay, so we're not going to have larger hips necessarily because we don't want to lose that efficiency. So we're just going to be born immature. Right? And we're going to allow the brains to grow after the baby comes out. That's brilliant, right? That was evolutionarily, that was a great development. Now, uh, how many of you have ever seen a horse that was born? Yeah, so those horses, right? As soon as they like, they're out, they're slimy, they're up and they're running, right? Babies, they're out, they're slimy. 35 years later, maybe, they're up on their own, right? It takes a while, okay? It takes a while for them to develop, right? Horses are a different story, right? They're up, if they're not up in a couple minutes, it's not gonna happen, right? And, 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 and we're sorry. Um, if babies don't start walking, you give them a year, right? baby's not walking after a year, then you think, well, maybe we ought to check this out, right? But, you know, give them a year and see what happens. I don't know. Is that a normal time for a baby? I just made up a number. Approximately, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> so there you go. We wanted big brains. We still want those relatively narrow hips, right? So how are we going to get around that? The other thing that we did is, so um, this is a little trick. I'm just going to tell you, like, side story. Uh, this is why you'll never know if a woman's fertile. Uh, is because the brains of babies are too small for them to take care of themselves. So it's really great to have somebody else hang around to help, right? And what's a great way to keep somebody else around is like, if, like not certain when they're fertile, so you might want to hang around to try to get another baby, right? Uh, this is why uh, human female genitals don't turn red uh, when, you're, when you're fertile, like chimpanzee genitals will turn bright red. Yeah, so you never thought about that, right? See, this is like, you're, now you're figuring out like why our social structures are the way they are. And it's all about red genitalia. Uh, you never thought how important that would be to your life. Um, but it is. it is. It's kind of an interesting story, actually. Uh, here's the evolution of primate species. All I want you to take away from this is what's the difference between an ape and a monkey? I get really, just as I got really frustrated when you say kill over instead of keel over, I'm going to get really frustrated if you call an ape a monkey or a monkey an ape. Right, because there's a big difference. And that big difference is a tail. It's an easy difference. If you've got a tail, you're a monkey. If you don't, you're an ape. If you don't know if you have a tail, stick your hand back there where the tag of your underwear are and see if you can grab anything. Right? There's probably nothing there. And then you'll go, I must be an ape. That's how you know. Questions about that? That one really bothers me too. Don't worry about that slide. This is kind of an interesting slide. Um, <clears throat> here we're looking at, these are uh, other species in the, uh, in the uh, Homo genus leading up to Homo sapiens. Their body size is about the same as ours, but uh, brain size we've drastically increased. Here are other apes that are in existence. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Their body size, their brain size is all relatively the same, but their body size uh, obviously much smaller, so it's kind of that body size to brain size ratio there that's that's sort of interesting. There's actually some debate actually whether or not chimpanzees should be categorized in the same genus as humans, which is, which is sort of an interesting idea. Um, <clears throat> human baby birth is actually a pretty dangerous process, right? Okay. Um, anybody have to go out the escape hatch when they were born? Anybody have, was anybody a C-section? Yeah, there you go, right? That happens sometimes, right? You don't fit out the normal way. Guess what happens? they got to cut a hole and pull you out. Um, it's a relatively common procedure, right? Guess how many times that's happened to gorillas? Exactly one time. Exactly one time this happened. Uh, and I know about this. It was on the BBC a couple years ago. It was really amazing. <clears throat> In fact, 
they had to get a human OBGYN to come and do the operation because there had never been uh, like a like ever uh, a gorilla who had complications during birth and so there was never a reason to do a c-section on a gorilla and they had to call in a human to do it and he was like well it's basically the same thing just like a little hairier but you know do a little extra shaving and cut and pull uh, that's kind of the process so it's kind of interesting other species they don't really have problems right they shoot babies out all the time because they've got smaller heads right and they got wider hips so there you go your head was about as big as it could have been when you were born. Obviously, for a few of you, it was too big, right? Because you didn't fit out. Uh, all right, so any questions about that before we talk about humane treatment of animals, including humans? Awesome. <clears throat> Not including a lot of what we talked about today when it came to experiments, because a lot of what we talked about today was sort of pre-approval process, right? Because we were talking about things in the 17, 18, 1900s before we established a lot of these criteria, right? Now, if you want to do studies with animals, there are anywhere between three and five, maybe even six or eight uh, outside entities that have to approve your work before you can do it, right? At a minimum, you've got to run stuff by what we call the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, right? Every institution has one of these. It's a group of folks who evaluate uh, the... Um, benefits versus cost of your studies to make sure you're doing things correctly. You could have uh, the federal government can come in in a variety of ways. That could be the FDA, depending on your research, the USDA, the DEA can come in. That can be frightening. If you ever come into work one day and a DEA agent is waiting on you, uh, that can be a little scary. Trust me, I know. Huh? Oh, <laughs> yeah, who knows who will come in? You know, U.S. Patent Office, you know, all kinds of folks will come in and I don't think that's a thing you should do, uh, but we'll see. So tons of folks can come in and say like, hey, we don't think you're doing things correctly. If you want to make sure you're doing things correctly, you have to provide appropriate care. When possible, you've got to reduce or eliminate discomfort. This becomes very difficult. Let's say you're doing a pain management study. The idea is for you to create a little discomfort, right? And so, But you have to have a plan to alleviate that discomfort that you've created, right? And so there's not undue discomfort. Uh, you got to work against infections, <clears throat> all of these things. You have to make sure they have appropriate space. Uh, they have to have the right airflow. The temperature has to be just right. Their food sources have to be appropriate and checked, right? So there are tons of things that really go into animal research uh, that a lot of folks I don't think think about if you've not done this. Humans, it's it, it, very similar, right? I mean, you still have to make sure you have humane care. You have to go for... Um, informed consent and I heard of something recently that I wasn't aware of a formed assent uh, right for, kids. for kids right so people without the capacity. yeah yeah so they just have to agree that they're gonna do it right yeah, doesn't, really mean much. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really mean much I like that but someone responsible for them has said yeah it's cool you got to protect protect confidentiality <clears throat> when you're dealing with folks if I were to run a research study in here and I were to you know publish those results like out on the door and I were to put like look at these idiots uh, that could really get us into some trouble, so we're not going to do that. Uh, and again, if you're doing human work, you have to still go through the Institutional Review Board. There are other groups that might come in, depending on where your funding's coming from. Right? If it's coming from the National Institutes of Health, they could send folks out to make sure you're doing things right. So there are a ton of things uh, that you have to do to make sure that you're, you know, everything's up and up with research. So anything that we talk about really going forward is going to have gone through these sort of protocols and these checks, right? The stuff we were talking about with like Galvani, nobody was checking on him while he was shocking frogs, right? That was that was kind of a free for all back then. It's different now, and so it's it's a whole different sort of setup. Again, we're always thinking about how are we working with uh, to improve health and alleviate disease. How is that adding to the knowledge of our brains? You know what we know about what's going on and how is this going to help, right? Uh, not about what kind of uh, you know can we just make holes in, in animals' brains. Don't worry too much about this. I'm not really going to get too worked up about uh, different types or different names for behavioral neuroscience. Anybody have any questions? That was a lot, right? That's why I told you don't take notes. Because if, if you take notes, you're just going to...